Lookout. Guardian. Sentry. In every mob of meerkats, there's always one watcher. While others are burrowing for food, one stands at the highest point possible and scans the horizon. A machine built to watch. Their long tail creates a tripod to rest on. Dark patches around their eyes reduce the sun's glare. A clear membrane keeps the dust out, and inside, a panoramic view of the surrounding desert. They're looking for anomalies in a landscape they know better than anyone. A shadow that moves faster than it should. A rock, a zebra, or something more dangerous. And as soon as they spot a potential threat, they raise the alarm. A signal for the rest to run for cover. Crisis averted, thanks to the lookout. When we are faced with threats, we rely on watchers too. In the dark, in the ocean, in the mountains. There have always been those who watch out to protect the rest. But who's looking out for the threats lurking online when you can't hear, feel, or smell them? Thankfully, there are watchers there too. Those who stare out at the horizon, waiting for something to move. When it's your job to keep billions of people safe online, you have to live and breathe and see the internet just like the attackers do. Because the only way to stop a hacker is to think like one. This is Shane Huntley. Before working at Google, Shane worked in a much different professional setting. What exactly did you do in Australian intelligence? I really can't get into that. So, how did an intelligence expert end up at Google? Well, unlike most professional origin stories, this one starts on vacation. It was early 2010. I was backpacking around India at the time. And I was at this internet cafe and I pulled up the news and there's all these articles about something called Operation Aurora. I was like, wow, like I was in the government and we knew all this stuff was going on, but none of the victims were ever willing to talk about it before this time. Meanwhile, 7,500 miles away, in reaction to Operation Aurora, seismic shifts were taking place in how Google handled security new technologies, new network architectures, new industry standards, new t-shirts, new mouse pads, but most importantly, new hires. As a security engineer at the time, if you were not working for a government or a contractor for a government, you might have never been exposed to these kinds of sophisticated attacks. We realized that we needed to create specialty teams to do specialty parts of the job, including a group who studies these hackers full time, nation state adversaries in particular, to prevent attackers like that from being successful. Which explains why a certain specialist on vacation in India got a message like this. Hey Shane, I'm starting this new team at Google. Do you want to move to California and do that? And soon after, I was coming over to start this threat analysis group and haven't looked back. The primary job of threat analysis is to understand the attacker so we can counter them and we can protect our users from them. We're dark wizard catchers. There's a lot of people on the internet that are trying to do bad things. It's our job to stop them. By understanding who those attackers are and how they operate, we're able to apply that information to stop attacks. So today we track, you know, over 270 different threat actors around the globe. These are government-backed threats, but also financially motivated threats, which is cybercrime, ransomware. And we also track disinformation threats, 
coordinated groups trying to run disinformation campaigns for malicious ends. The Threat Analysis Group is commonly referred to by its acronym, TAG. The nickname is appropriate, considering how TAG hunts down and, well, tags malicious actors and their techniques. So security teams across all of Google and beyond can forge defenses and responses, even before an attack takes place. Their smarts have helped prevent dangerous junk from popping up in your personal email and have helped keep trade secrets locked down at Fortune 500 companies. They've helped trace a mystery super virus to its perpetrators and have helped protect organizations from local canasta groups to national campaigns. TAG hasn't always had the impact that it has today, but everybody has to start somewhere. I managed to join Google the week after the very last thing of Aurora. It was like hundreds of people there weeks before to work through the Aurora attack. But when I started, there were only like 10 of us in the building. And I'm turning up all like, you know, bright eyed, having gone through my Google training, like, okay, what are we gonna do? How many pieces of malware do we have? Five. Okay. How many threat groups do we know about? One. Okay. So, Greenfields, we were somewhat starting from scratch. The team worked with what they had. They analyzed. They hunted. They staffed up with new experts, like Tony here. Yep. They built out dossiers on threat actors and reports on attack strategies. But the team's greatest strength didn't come from new technology, but something that Google had been working on since its inception. We have, surprise, surprise, a really great search engine software. To make that search engine run, Google downloads the entirety of the public-facing internet to its data centers, the good and the bad. From there, the dangerous sites and content are generally flagged before they ever reach your results page. But that doesn't mean they're useless. These bits of bad content are exactly what the tag team is looking for. The things that need to be blocked. Exploits. Software that needs to be fixed. Phishing messages. Almost every piece of malicious software that exists anywhere on the internet. We can see what they do when they run. We can like look at what's inside them. This is something which would, for anyone else, like I don't know how they build it or it would take decades, but for us, it's sort of just lying around in the search team and we're able to use that sort of scale and technology for our mission as well. So one of the things that we do in TAG is we actually take a copy of the search engine software and we feed in every piece of malicious software that we've run across on the internet and then we index it. So we have our own version of Google search just for searching through malicious software. And this is valuable because even when attackers try very hard to evade, there's always some signatures of what they're doing and some ability to link things together. And a great example is what we did with a piece of ransomware called WannaCry. The WannaCry attack is running rampant. Malware WannaCry. 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 A ransomware has been around for a long time, but WannaCry is different. WannaCry was the biggest ransomware attack in history. It's a pervasive type of attack where hackers hold victims' computers hostage. In a single day, WannaCry infected over 200,000 computers in 150 countries, crippling major institutions like banks, universities, and even bringing Britain's National Health Service to a standstill. It was being sent out everywhere. It was causing all of this damage, but nobody knew who was behind it. In the same way you might reverse image search to see where a picture came from, the team took the malware and plugged it into their search engine. Because we'd run these billions of pieces of software and looked at them all, we can really drill down and find what's related, depending on how it behaves, what accounts they're using to set up, to upload. There's all these details down to like the lowest level of specifically how this one snippet of code is being used. By looking at those details, we're able to find that one link that was able to determine that it wasn't somebody just trying to steal money. It was the North Korean government. After careful investigation, the United States is publicly attributing the massive WannaCry cyber attack to North Korea. We do not make this allegation lightly. We do so with evidence and we do so with partners. We used to think about intelligence services or country versus country, but now often we actually see country versus individual or country versus company. We certainly want to defend against Google itself getting hacked. What we really see that's much more common is attackers coming after our users. Day to day, we are trying to be the people that stand between the attackers and you to keep you safe. Tracking adversaries is an important part of TAG's mission. 
but the most critical is learning from these bad actors to build better defenses. Something Camille Stewart Gloucester knows a thing or two about. For three years, she ensured that Google products evolved to stay ahead of the threat landscape. All of the work happening across the various Google security teams directly supports safer Google products. The intelligence that TAG sends to different products allows them to be more resilient. So it's not just about the whack-a-mole of stopping an individual campaign. It's being able to turn around to Gmail, Chrome, or YouTube, or Google Drive, and say, hey, if we address this, we can eliminate an entire class of attacks and protect all these users. So what exactly are they addressing? All the techniques attackers use to go after Google's products and their users. Yeah, so there's so many different ways to try and get around our defenses. One of the most common that we see is phishing. Well now take down your fishing pole and meet me at the vision hole. We may not get a bite all day, but don't you rush away. Phishing. It's the kind of attack where bad actors email, call, or text to try and trick you into clicking on malicious links or handing over identifying information, passwords, or credit card numbers. It's a type of attack that many of us are all too familiar with. Attackers are gonna prey on whatever they think people will click on. Um, so whether that's... Threats. Money. A salacious bit of gossip. Fear is a big one. So when the pandemic started, we saw a huge uptick in targeting around COVID-19. As citizens, we were all looking for information and likely ready to consume anything that might provide some clarity. This became the ideal strike zone for attackers, preying on people's fear and confusion around the pandemic to capture their clicks, leveraging phony details to private personal information and to peddle sham vaccines and treatments. There's a lot of money to be made, so you have this explosion driven by criminal motivations. How do we protect users from the scope and the scale of these types of attacks? And a huge part of it is making sure it never makes it to your inbox. Inside Gmail's code are filters built in to block over 100 malicious messages every second. If Google wasn't catching all of that malicious activity, the spam, phishing, and malware, your inbox would essentially be a field of landmines. This mine sweeping is accomplished through a web of smart filters that evolve and reorient based on the threats of the day. They not only block things, but they learn from everything they block. They are leveraging the intelligence from the tag team to pull from your inbox 99.9% .9 of the threats. I think what keeps me up at night is just what's at stake for some people. You know, Gmail has over a billion users. We have to secure everyone. And certainly, there are people who have a bigger risk profile than most. That's politicians, that's other government employees, that's journalists, civil society. All these people are targets that we have to protect. In most cases, the first step in being protected is knowing you might be a potential target. We actually tell every single user that's targeted by a government-backed threat. We put a big warning at the top of their Gmail or other service to let them know that. We've stopped this type of attempt, we blocked it, but we want you to know that this is happening. Some people think this would be really rare, but actually, like, over the course of a year, we actually warn around 36,000 different users that they're targeted by some government or another. There's perhaps no greater concentration of foreign nation-state targets in the U.S. than in the government. Just ask Michael Kaiser. He's the head of Defending Digital Campaigns, a group dedicated to providing cybersecurity resources to campaign officials on the national stage. There are folks in this world who would not like to see democracy succeed. Bad actors who are trying to influence an outcome or make the process look less legitimate, and campaigns would be a target of those people. We don't run any election infrastructure. We don't build software for voting machines. But we do have candidates and political figures that use our services such as Gmail, they use our phones. And we do see that there are hostile actors that are trying to interfere with the political system of not just US elections, but elections worldwide. 
One of the things that's so difficult about this is that political campaigns in a lot of ways are a pickup game. So who is part of a campaign? Well, you have staffers, you probably have volunteers, you have the candidate, and then you have people like the candidate's family, close friends, confidants. All these people are connected to the campaign. We believe that anyone associated with a campaign is at higher risk. Even if I'm an intern, if they can compromise my account, that gives the attacker a foothold into the campaign's network. It's not enough to sort of draw a fence around the people that you see on the front page of the newspaper. The reality is you have to secure everyone. After all its years in business, Google has learned a thing or two about protecting large groups of people and has used those learnings to create something called the Advanced Protection Program. Advanced Protection Program is open to any user. It's very similar to what Google does with its own employees, and it works. Basically, what it requires is two-factor authentication. That makes your account a lot more secure because it means that an attacker, even if they've managed to figure out your password, they can't get into your account. If you have two-factor authentication, your account pretty much becomes unfishable. It tremendously cuts down on the amount of risk from all of these corners of the internet. Protecting the democratic system is a fundamental thing that keeps me enthused about my job and makes me proud of what we do in our team. This is some of our most high priority work and something that we really take very seriously. The problems that the threat analysis group monitors may seem larger than life. Most of us have enough to manage without having to worry about nation states and cyber criminals encroaching on our accounts. Over the last decade, the actors have got a lot better about what they do. And they've had to, right? Because of teams like TAG, we haven't made their life easy. And this is valuable because the more effort they have to expend, the safer the users are. Each innovation created from TAG's insights makes it a little more expensive to target users. So although there are new attackers entering the game all the time, the table stakes to get to Google users are often entirely out of their reach. I'm in this battle not because I believe we'll lose. I'm in this battle because I believe we can win. We may not win 100% of the time, but we can make a lot more people a lot more secure and prevent a lot of attacks. That's what we're here for, is to take that weight off of our users' shoulders. We want you to use two-factor authentication and not click on suspicious links. Leave the rest to us. <laughs> We're a lot like the 911 system, a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week force against whatever it is that we're facing. Right now, there are thousands of attacks being launched against Google. We started seeing North Korea targeting security researchers, fake social media profiles. One of the last people you want having their hands on this kind of information is the North Korean government. We might have to burn it all down and start from scratch. I love it. 